Okay, so my name is Paul Chignon, and I'm going to talk to you about some work I did on BCC, and I'm going to talk about what BCC is first, uh, with Klang Reuter. <clears throat> so the BCC project um, is a number of things. I'm not a maintainer of the BCC project. I contributed a few patches to, to that project, um, and I'm going to focus this talk on what I contributed to the BCC project. So. It's mostly known for being a collection of BPF-based tracing tools for Linux. Uh, it's been demoed in a number of conferences, but it's also a library to ease the development of BPF, uh, of BPF programs. So uh, you have a, a Python layer, and you can use that to develop programs. I'm going to dig a bit into what that is. <coughs> but first, uh, let's talk about quickly what BPF is. So BPF is a way to extend uh, the Linux kernel from a high-level view. Um, it's a, a bytecode that you can load in the kernel. It's, um, it's a bytecode that you can load in the kernel. It's going to be attached to different hook points in the kernel. So for instance, you can attach it to drivers, to uh, care probes, to different tracing points. Um, and that's it. And the, the main point about BPF is that it's statically verified in the kernel before running it. So when you load the program, it's going to be statically verified. And then at runtime, there are a few additional checks but it's mostly static uh, verification. Uh, so these verifications are there to prevent crashes, mostly. Um, for most BPF programs, you have to be root to run them and to load them in the kernel, so it's there to prevent crashes. But in some cases, you can load BPF programs in the kernel, in the Linux kernel, uh, without root privileges. So in this case, the static verification and the dynamic verifications are there to prevent also that you can't escape the BPF VM, of course. Uh, so one thing you have to know for this talk about BPF is that uh, from the BPF VM in the bytecode, you can call <coughs> external functions. So there are functions implemented in the Linux kernel outside the BPF VM. They're used to do a number of things you can't do from inside the VM. So for instance, here um, on the left-hand side, I have three examples, well, two examples of functions uh, in purple. Uh, they're used to uh, address, to access uh, data structures outside the BPF VM, so persistent data outside the BPF VM. OK, so uh, as far as tracing tools in BCC, there are a large number of them. They cover lots of different things uh, in the Linux kernel. And they go from uh, tracing latency at the driver level to uh, system calls. And the main thing about BPF and the, the, the interest of using BPF for doing tracing is that you can aggregate data in the kernel before uh, re uh, retrieving it in user space. So for instance, if you want to measure uh, disk latencies, you're going to measure disk latencies in the kernel. You're going to compute something like a histogram in the kernel. And once you're finished, you're going to just send the aggregate data to user space. You don't have to go back to user space uh, for each measurement. So at this point, I was supposed to do a demo. But since I'm not on my computer, I'm not going to be able to do a demo. Uh, the demo wasn't really. It's just to, to try and show you the interest of, uh, BPA, of BCC. Uh, so it was just demoing like a tool to measure latencies and another one to, to measure uh, packet drops. Um, so this is one of the tools I was supposed to demo. Um, it's, you're not supposed to look at the details here. I'm going to go over them later. Uh, but the main thing is, uh, this is a BCC uh, script. Uh, the part on the left-hand side uh, is the BPF program. You can see that there's a huge string inside a Python script. So the huge string is actually a C program that's going to be compiled down to BPF, to BPF bytecode. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have everything you need in user space to manage a program and to retrieve statistics and display them to the user. So this interface to load programs and manage them uh, in user space is provided by BCC. And I'm going to talk about a rewriting of the C code on the left-hand side. But first, uh, let's go over how BPF works. And at a high level, how do we manage and load programs in the kernel? So we have user space and kernel space. Uh, first, we're going to write some uh, BPF program in C. Then we can use the uh, BPF backend in LLVM uh, to compile it to uh, a bytecode in user space. We're going to load this bytecode uh, in the kernel. Uh, for that, we have to use uh, the BPF syscall. At this point, it's going to be verified by the kernel. And then it's going to be uh, JIT compiled if you've enabled JIT compiling in the kernel for BPF. Then you can load some uh, data structures in the kernel uh, to be used by the BPF program. So for instance, here I have some representation of an hash map. 
there are a number of other data structures you can use in BPF programs. They're stored outside the BPF VM. So uh, between different calls of the BPF VM, you still have this data that persists uh, among calls, across calls, sorry. Uh, then, once all of this is in place, uh, you have to attach this BPF program to uh, some hook. Uh, so you could attach it to a K-probe, or to a driver, or to the traffic classifier, and a number of others. OK, so in BCC, we, we use the clone rewriter, uh, which is a part of clone that is able to do a source-to-source -source transformation. So we use it to transform the source, uh, the, C the C program at the beginning uh, to try and provide some synthetic sugar to users, so to try to abstract some of the uh, complexities of BPF away from the user. And then we transform it into another C program that then is going to be compiled to the BPF bytecode. So uh, in BCC, the, the clone rewriter is used for a number of different things. Uh, so for instance, it's used to, uh, to parse the map definitions in our programs. I'm going to give an example of that later. And these map definitions are passed from the C program. And then we create from that uh, the syscall to load them, to create them in the kernel. Uh, we also use uh, the clone rewriter for, um, to parse function names because uh, the function names actually have different patterns in BCC and you can just say something like uh, kprob underscore underscore and the name of the function you want to trace. So we're going to parse this and then use it to attach the program to the, the appropriate function. Uh, then of course we rewrite function declarations. Uh, I'm going to talk a li little about this later uh, to fit what the kernel is expecting. Um, we rewrite map accesses. Again, I'm going to show one example of this later. And the last thing is we rewrite uh, the references of pointers to the kernel memory. So I'm going to focus this talk on this last, uh, last item of the list and explain first what I mean by this. So <clears throat> um, in this example, so in the BPF VM, when you want to access uh, memory from the kernel, which is something you're going to do in a lot of cases if you're doing tracing, uh, if you want to read some data from the kernel to do your measurements. Um, the, the verifier can't really verify this at, uh, before, uh, before at, at, load ta at load time. Sorry. Um, so it has to do it at runtime. Uh, for a simple reason, all of these accesses can have variable offsets, so it's very difficult to uh, statically verify it uh, in the kernel before executing the program. Um, so what you have to do in this case is you have to call an external function, so a function implemented outside the BPF VM, to do this kind of yeah. accesses to the kernel memory. So for instance here, um, I'm going to have so one argument, prev. Uh, I'm going to put all external uh, pointers in orange, so pointers to the kernel memory uh, in the remaining of the slides. So for instance here, I have prev that is an external pointer, so pointer to the kernel memory. And uh, to be able to read the value, uh, to dereference the value of prev, I have to use uh, BPF prob read, that is an external function. Um, so one other thing on this slide that you have to notice is um, BPF programs only take a single argument. Uh, that single argument is called the context argument. So it's the first argument of my function. And then the BCC uh, library actually rewrites this in order to retrieve prev from the context argument. So the reason the context argument is not considered an external pointer, a pointer to kernel memory, is that it's already statically verified by the kernel because the kernel knows its length and knows what it contains, uh, but it doesn't know this for all of its uh, members. So for the prev member, for instance, you have to, to do it at runtime. OK, so uh, this function is actually um, the context switch is in the kernel, so between the previous process and the next process. And here I'm retrieving the previous process. So with BCC, what we offer is we try to make, uh, make it so that the user can use the references as usual without caring about uh, external pointers and the fact that they are uh, actually pointers to the kernel memory. So what, we, what the user writes is, as usual, just prev, and then it's going to access the PID member. And in the background, what we're going to do is rewrite the source code in order to uh, replace this with a call to BPF per read. <coughs> and what that means is that we have to track all external pointers at the source level, at the C level. And, and that's what we do with, with Clang. 
Okay, so before we continue, um, just a point about uh, the uh, false positive and false negatives. So we don't aim to be perfect. It's, as I will show in the remaining slides, it's very difficult in some cases to be perfect. In some cases, we don't even have all the information to know whether a pointer is a pointer to external uh, memory, to memory outside the VM. Uh, but there are two cases where we may be wrong. So false positives means we are adding unnecessary calls to BPF probread. So we're trying to replace some of the references with calls with two BPF probreads when we shouldn't be because it's not needed. Uh, what that means is that um, we don't have some additional overhead when doing these calls to the external function instead of just doing a memory access uh, in the VM. Uh, it's also may lead to some syntax errors because it's sometimes a bit messy when you try to rewrite something twice or things like that. I'm going to mention this in, in the conclusion. Uh, and false negatives are the main issue here. Um, if we miss some BPF probit, so if we uh, forget to uh, if we yeah, if we forget to replace a reference with a call to BPF probit. Uh, it means that the program is going to be compiled to bytecode, it's going to be loaded in the kernel, and then once in the kernel, uh, the verifier is going to reject the program saying that it's trying to access memory outside the VM. Then it's going to, re to send an error to, to the user, and since it detected this in the kernel, it's not going to have a lot of context about why this error is there, and so it's not going to provide something very user-friendly to the user. So the error message in this second case is really uh, difficult for the user to understand. So we really want to try to avoid this issue. <clears throat> okay, so first, uh, where do external pointers come from? So I've said that they can come from the context argument. So there are, for instance, uh, members of the context uh, structure. So for instance, prev in my previous example. Uh, but they can also come from external functions. So for instance, here I have an external function called BPF get current task. So I'm, I'm still in the function that is doing the context switch between different processes. I have the previous one, I'm trying to retrieve the current one. And <clears throat> uh, this type of function can also return uh, external pointers, so pointers to the kernel memory. Next thing I have to decide is how do I identify uh, variables? And in particular, how do I identify uh, external pointers? Or how do I compare them? So I could use uh, a very naive way to do it would be to, to use the variable names. Uh, but that wouldn't work if I have different, vari different variables called the same in different functions, for instance. So it really wouldn't work. Uh, so the way we do it is we use uh, something called krong uh, dec, so the declaration of the variable to, to try and identify it. So in this case, uh, the task uh, variable is identified by its declaration here uh, in the function prototype. OK, so once we have this initial information, uh, we need to traverse the AST to try and track all external pointers to the code. Um, to do so, we're going to follow all function calls. And as we go, we're going to update the state of external pointers. So for instance, if we have an assignment uh, of an external pointer to some other pointer, uh, obviously, we have to add this, this new pointer to the set of uh, external pointers. Um, then once we've done this first traversal to detect all external pointers, uh, we're going to do a second traversal that's much easier, and just to replace all of the differences to external pointers we detected. OK, so for instance, here I'm going to parse uh, a function declaration. So I have different arguments. When I hit the function declaration, I'm going to uh, go look at the second argument. Uh, if it's a pointer, I'm going to add it to the set of external pointers. Then I'm going to look at the different, uh, at the body of the function, so the different statements. Uh, when I hit, for instance, the binary operator, if it's an assignment, I'm going to check if the uh, right hand side is an external pointer or returns an external pointer. And then if it does, I'm going to assign uh, the left hand side. I'm going to say the left hand side is also an external pointer. So I'm going to do this for the code. I have to do it for, so also for um, arguments of functions and for the values written by functions. OK, so it's not that easy yet. We also have to track uh, the number of indirections of pointers. So for instance, in my code, I could have a pointer to an external pointer. Uh, that's the case here with uh, the variable PTR. So for instance, PTR is a pointer to the external pointer SK. When I'm doing the first dereference of PTR, I don't want to replace it with a call to BPF probably, because that value is on the stack. 
but I want to replace the second one, the member access to SK uh, D address. So uh, we don't want to rewrite uh, all external pointers. We want to track when we should do the rewrite and at which point. Uh, so that means that we need to track all of the different uh, address of and the reference operators in the code, which again adds to complexity. Uh, the next case is uh, we have to track external pointers to maps. So at the beginning, I mentioned that BPF programs can use persistent data structures outside of the VM. So someone may very well uh, store an external pointer in one of these data structures and then retrieve it in some other function uh, later in the code. Uh, so this, in this example, at the top of the, the code, I have a declaration of BPF hash. It's a kind of a map in, uh, in BCC. Uh, it's actually going to be rewritten into something else, and it's going to be created from this code. It's going to create the syscall to create the map. And then I have some different accesses to the map. So for instance, uh, CureSoc update. Uh, this, again, is going to be rewritten by the BCC library. I'm going to store an external pointer in CURSOC, and then I'm going to retrieve it in the trace exit function uh, later on. At this point, I'm going to use it to dereference uh, to retrieve some value from the kernel memory, so I have to rewrite uh, this last dereference. This is a very common example because when you're doing tracing, uh, at the trace entry, so when you're doing tracing of the, the entry of a function and the return of a function, uh, you do have all of the arguments of the function you're trying to trace at the entry, but you don't have any of them at the return point, so they're not in the registers. Uh, so when you want to manipulate to, to read some of these parameters at the return point, some of these arguments at the return point, you have to store them somewhere and then uh, be able to retrieve them when you hit the return point of the function. So that's exactly what we're doing here. We're storing the SK argument and then retrieving it to perform some reads on it. Uh, so the way we handle this is we did several traversals of the AST. So the first traversal is the same as usual. We just try to track all of the external pointers to the code. Then the second one is going to track all of the maps that contains external pointers. So at this point, we know where the external pointers are in the code. So we can just look for calls to CURSOC update, for instance, and say, well, if this argument is an external pointer, then I know that this map contains an external pointer. And then in the last traversal, we're doing the same as the first, except that instead of taking the context argument and as sources, uh, we're going to take the maps as sources. So for instance, we're going to look for all of the different lookups to maps, and we know that in this case, we have external pointers in these maps. And then again, we're going to probably exist through the code and do the rewrite in the last uh, traversal. So to conclude, uh, I think this is uh, a bit um, it's a bit of a complex approach because we're trying to do it at the source level in C. Uh, there are a number of things that are more complicated than we, we would hope. Uh, so for instance, we have to do several traversals of the AST. Uh, the implementation, as I said, was more complex. We struggled a lot with uh, rewrites of the code why we are, uh, so for instance, all of the different calls to clone rewriter uh, replace text. So we are trying to replace text uh, as we go, and in some cases, it's very difficult to manage the offsets of where we should replace, and in some cases, we try to replace text that has already been replaced, and it messing, messes things up. Um, and despite all of this complexity, it's still not complete, and it probably never will be complete, because we, in some cases, we don't have all the information we need uh, to identify all of the external pointers. So for instance, um, if I have two different programs separated in different files, uh, one of them might be uh, updating a value in a map, putting an external pointer in a map, and in the second program, I might be reading from that map. So in this case, I will have an external pointer in the second program, and that I have no way to identify it as an external pointer. Now the question is, are there better approaches to, to handle this issue? So we could do it at the bytecode level, for instance, uh, but in this case, we would have to rewrite a debarser of the BPF bytecode. Um, Maybe that's the approach to take. Uh, we could take some very extreme op option where we rewrite all of the different uh, dereferences of uh, data structures that have been of structures that have been defined in the kernel headers. So that's a bit of an extreme approach because we would rewrite a lot of other uh, pointers that are not <coughs> needed. Um, we could ask the developers to label the different uh, variables to say whether they are actually external pointers. But if we start doing this, why wouldn't we just tell him to, 
to to use BPF for breeds and not care with not try to do this job for him. And there may be other solutions. I'm all here if you have others. Uh, thanks for listening. The code is on GitHub. Uh, everything I've talked about, uh, it's actually quite short. Well, it's kind of a big file, but it's a single file mostly. Uh, so it's on GitHub on the BCC uh, project. And uh, I think I have time for questions. This one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was curious about. Um, so like the kernel already kind of requires um, kind of labeling of pointers. So like the the kernel will, will use um, certain like macro defines that expand to attribute um, section or uh, attribute address space. Mm -hmm. For BPF, you mean? Uh, ju just separate from BPF. Okay. Already the Lance kernel mm -hmm. that does this as a way of kind of separating these things. So I, I'm curious. Um, as far as like labeling external pointers, if you have users label them just in the in the parameters, right? That should still give you enough information to be able to re to rewrite to insert those probe calls. Right? Um, yeah, yeah, you should. So without like, you know, the user still has to be explicit about you know what what's there or not, but but then that still gives you enough information to, so that they don't have to spell out. Yeah, but I mean, the issue is we're trying to to abstract all of this away from the user. So we're trying to have the user not being a, not having to care about whether this is an external pointer. So if we sure. try to do this, uh, probably we're going to succeed. But the thing is, we're going to ask the user to care about this, and right. so that's what so we're trying to avoid. Well, I, I'm just curious, like if if you were to do approach where you have an always explicit kind of thing of like labeling the pointers explicitly, mm -hmm. and and then. Like you get the machinery working well for always inserting those probe reads mm -hmm. or probe writes wherever necessary, um, then it's probably easier to then add the syntactic sugar on top. When you do the rewriting, is you know that every parameter yeah. after the first, then you can add that to it. Yeah, clearly. Uh, if you try to identify pointers on IR level, for example, from uh, a lock instructions or load. No, we didn't try this. Uh, but the main thing is, oh, okay. Uh, so the question was, uh, have we tried to identify these external pointers at the IR level? Uh, we haven't tried it. Uh, the main thing is, it would add maybe a bit of complexity to the Clang uh, side of things this time. So I'm not sure whether that would be acceptable upstream. If you try to do it in BCC, maybe it's a better approach, but I'm not sure. And we would have to do. Uh, yeah, I haven't looked into it, so I'd have to look into it to, to be sure. Yeah. Yes, I'm just curious, how does this whole BPF machinery guard against the memory disappearing from under you? Like, if you store a pointer in a map, yeah. and, and like, the, the thing it points to just disappears, or with like permission or something like that? Yeah. Uh, so this is why you have BPF probe reads. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so the question is, um, how, the, how does the BPF machinery uh, guards against uh, memory disappearing uh, um, uh, below you. So for instance, uh, if you have a pointer in a map and then the pointer is not valid anymore because it's been uh, freed, the memory has been freed, uh, how do you guard against this? So an access to, invalid, to um, an initialized memory. Uh, so the thing is, it's why we use BPF probe reads at runtime. These BPF probe reads are going to check the memory to, sh to be sure that it's uh, safe, that we're not trying to read something that's um, not there, for instance. I don't think that's something it checks. Um, so this is what is checked at runtime, yeah, for instance. So this only works for specific structures in the kernel, or does it work for everything? No, it works for everything. But the thing is, it's, uh, these programs need uh, root privileges. So uh, you, you're not trying to guard against uh, escape of the memory. You're only trying to guard against crashes of the BPFVM on the kernel. Uh, so maybe that 
changes a bit of things. Uh, if you have a, if you don't have root privileges to run a program, so for instance, uh, I think programs attached to uh, sockets don't need, in some cases, uh, root privileges. In these cases, you can't read memory outside the VM. So you have different restrictions based on whether you have root privileges or not. Yeah. You said that you might need to modify LVM IR if you were to represent all this on the IR level. Couldn't you make this work with LVM IR address spaces and just tag the different address spaces and have a pass that checks through that? I'm not familiar with this, so I'm really interested to, yeah. I, Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, why wouldn't we uh, use another language than, rather than doing uh, C2C transformations? Uh, it's a good question. It's a bit over my head because it's, uh, <coughs> I mean, it's, I guess it's a bit of legacy choices. So for instance, uh, lots of people are used to, to doing C programs to write in the kernel. So that might be one of the reasons. Uh, but surely it may be another approach to use. Some projects have used that approach. So for instance, um, uh, the C uh, front end is not the only front end. In the BCC library, you also have a Lua front end. Not sure it changes a lot, but maybe. Uh, and you have other higher level languages that are specific to tracing that have been wrote uh, to, to be then compiled to BPF.